August 22nd, 1862, Abraham Lincoln wrote one of the most important letters of his life. This could be the most widely quoted letter that Abraham Lincoln ever wrote. It was a public letter that he wrote to newspaper editor Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune. The letter begins, Honorable Horace Greeley, dear sir, I have just read yours of the 19th, addressed to me through the New York Tribune. If there be in it any statements or assumptions of fact which I know to be erroneous, I do not now and here controvert them. If there be in it any inferences which I may believe to be falsely drawn, I do not now and here argue against them. If there be perceptible in it an impatient and dictatorial tone, I wave it in deference to an old friend whose heart I have always supposed to be right. Now here's the thing. <laughs> How do you read that opening paragraph? It, it determines everything about what you think about this encounter. I read this as flat out sarcasm. I have read yours of the 19th addressed to myself through the New York Tribune. Lincoln is upset that Horace Greeley has written him a public letter, but that he published it in his newspaper rather than sending it to him directly. He waves a number of uh, dictatorial references and impatient tone. But by noting them, he's not waving them at all. He's highlighting them. Uh, and even though he calls Greeley an old friend, if you know anything about the relationship of Horace Greeley and Abraham Lincoln, you know that they have known each other for a number of years, but it's been a contested relationship, and they've had a number of ups and downs. And if you have any doubt about how to read the tone of that opening paragraph, the next sentence seems to give it away as far as I'm concerned. Lincoln writes, as to the policy I quote, seem to be pursuing, as you say, I have not meant to leave anyone in doubt. Lincoln quotes uh, in, a, in a defensive way a line that Greeley had used in his open letter from August 19th that really seemed to aggravate and annoy the president. If you go to that letter from Greeley, and you really have to in order to appreciate this text, you understand why Lincoln was being sarcastic and why he was in some ways insulted by Greeley. The editor of the Tribune had written on the 19th to the President of the United States, I do not intrude to tell you, for you must know already that a great proportion of those who triumphed in your election and all of who desire the unqualified suppression of the rebellion now desolating our country are sorely disappointed and deeply pained by the policy you seem to be pursuing with regard to the slaves of the rebels. Now this is, this is a critical moment in the war, the summer of 1862. Horace Greeley is a Republican and a Unionist, and the New York Tribune is a leading supporter of the war effort from the North, and yet here they are openly criticizing the President of the United States. This is because, in some ways, the Congress of the United States has pushed the President to do something about the slaves of the rebels, as Greeley puts it. And it's, this is something that people forget, but it's important to recall here. The context is everything. This is all about the passage of something called the Second Confiscation Act, an act of Congress adopted on July 17, 1862, that included provisions to declare the slaves of the rebels captives of war and to, quote, free them, make them, quote, forever free. And Greeley writes about this act here. He says, we think you are strangely and disastrously remiss in the discharge of your official and imperative duty with regard to the emancipating provisions of the new Confiscation Act. Why, he says, these traitors should be treated with tenderness by you to the prejudice of the dearest rights of loyal men we cannot conceive. See, sometimes in the memory of the war in the years since, people imagine somehow that the Emancipation Proclamation came out of Lincoln's pen like a bolt of lightning uh, that he announced after the Battle of Antietam and put in motion on January 1st. But it was born in the political battles of the summer of 1862, and it was a direct response to the Second Confiscation Act. You can't understand emancipation and Lincoln's attitude toward it without understanding confiscation and these provisions to emancipate slaves that were adopted in July, and now by the middle of August, really wants to know when the president is going to implement them. And so in the rest of Lincoln's letter to Greeley, his response, he proceeds to outline it. He says, I would save the Union 
I would save it in the shortest way under the Constitution. The sooner the national authority can be restored, the nearer the Union will be, quote, the Union as it was. Now that's an interesting quotation there. You don't necessarily have to know what he's quoting to realize that it's important he is quoting something there. The Union as it was turns out to be a slogan of the Democrats during the midterm elections of 1862. The Constitution as it is and the Union as it was, this becomes a rallying cry for critics of the administration, especially later known as Copperheads. The Democrats who oppose the war, who oppose the administration, and who are trying to stop the conflict and are willing to accept a continuation of slavery in order to do it. Lincoln uses this quotation from the rallying cry as a kind of political jujitsu, as a way to use their slogan to assert this is what he was trying to do. He says, if there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time save slavery, I do not agree with them. And if there be those who would not save the Union unless they could at the same time destroy slavery, I do not agree with them. Lincoln is putting himself between two positions, two extremes. But he's doing that as a strategy, at least that's how I read it. Now you can argue over this, but I'll show you how I make this argument in the next sentences, which seem to be plain English, but I think hold an awful lot of subtext behind them. Lincoln uses a phrase that he's used before in his career. He writes next, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. He writes, if I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. What I do about slavery and the colored race, he writes, I do because I believe it helps to save the Union and what I forbear, I forbear because I do not believe it would help to save the Union. Now, that's plain English. He says his paramount object is to save the Union. Everything he does is to save the Union. But the subtext there, and the reason why this is so strategic, is because you have to ask yourself, which Union is he saving? Is it a Union of States? Is it the Union as it was? Or is it something else? Lincoln says it's a union. He says it's the union as it was, but it is no longer to him a union of states. It is a union of people. What he is doing time and again during the Civil War is defending the union of people who came together after the election of 1860 to elect a party, the Republicans, who were committed to seeing through the eventual destruction of slavery in the United States. They weren't going to abolish it in the states where it existed, but they were going to contain it and they were going to turn the future of the country toward freedom. This is what Lincoln said earlier in his career when he talked about a house divided against itself cannot stand. And he did not expect slavery to prevail but freedom. And now here, he is invoking that again. He says at the end of the letter, I shall do less whenever I shall believe what I am doing hurts the cause, and I shall do more whenever I shall believe doing more will help the cause. I shall try to correct errors when shown to be errors, and I shall adopt new views so fast as they appear to be true views. Now what makes this even more compelling as a, an argument for strategy, for thinking that Lincoln is doing something behind the scenes more than what he's suggesting in public, is because when he writes these lines, especially when he writes these lines to Greeley, he's already decided to emancipate the slaves. He's already written the first draft of a military order triggered by the Second Confiscation Act that will emancipate slaves across the South in a, in a way that was more sweeping even than Congress had envisioned. And Lincoln knows that as soon as Greeley and others in the Republican Party who support the emancipation of slaves, as soon as they see what he's planning, they'll be stunned and thrilled. But he also knows that those in his party who oppose what he's about to do are going to be upset and worried. Those who support the preservation of the Union and are willing to allow slavery to continue, perhaps those who live in slave states loyal to the Union like Kentucky or Missouri or Delaware or Maryland, those people are going to be very upset 
and perhaps it'll fracture the Union Coalition. So for those people in August of 1862, he's explaining what he's already decided to do in terms that they would accept to save the Union. And then he adds with one last remark that was designed to help smooth over the ruffled feathers with the abolitionists and the anti-slavery forces and Horace Greeley. He writes, I have here stated my purpose according to my view of official duty, and I intend no modification of my oft expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. Lincoln was always clear to try to separate what he believed as an individual and what he thought he was responsible for as president. And he makes that distinction here again, but in a way that um, lends his sympathy to the cause of freedom and abolition. He would say later, I'm always nat I've always been naturally anti-slavery, and he says it here. He has an oft-expressed personal wish that all men everywhere could be free. But he knows that freedom is coming. He's planning to announce it. He's waiting for a victory. And he's worried that if that victory doesn't come soon enough, uh, if he announces freedom in a political deadlock, it could create catastrophe for the Republican Party in the midterm elections in the fall of 62 or beyond. And so he needs to frame the decision that's coming in terms that will have the broadest possible appeal. And that's the strategic genius of the Greeley letter. Uh, and to add one final element that helps underline how strategic this letter was, it's a public letter written in a public campaign about the leading public issue of the day. Lincoln doesn't send this letter to Horace Greeley directly. He publishes it in a rival newspaper as a way to add the final closure to this public argument over how to proceed at this critical moment in the war.